All right. Signal. Well, they're supposed to be PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, good. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, we left off last time in Isaiah chapter 21. Isaiah 21. Um, and of course, this is, you know, the main point of these slides is just to kind of uh, remind us of general outline type things, mainly so I don't have to write it all up on the board over and over. Uh, but, you know, here's, of course, the outline of the book. We're in the middle of the uh, section, the B section, where it says that the proud nations are humbled, chapters 13 through 27. And we're in the middle of a, a cycle of the na oracles against the nations, in which the headings are somewhat cryptic and. Um, well, if it hadn't messed up, it would say 21, 1 through 17, Babylon and her allies. Uh, I don't know what happened there with the formatting, but I will fix that in the next edition, I'm tell I assure you. Um, chapters 21 through 23 are some very cryptic oracles. Isaiah spends a lot of his oracles against the nations. He'll usually start out with a heading like, you know, this is the oracle against Babylon, or this is the oracle against Moab. You know, but then you get to chapter 21, he starts talking about the wilderness of the sea. Well, what's that? You know, the Valley of Vision. Well, what's that talking about? And, you know, well, I put up here that, you know, the wilderness of the sea, you read the oracle, it's pretty clear he's talking about Babylon because he says in the middle of it, fallen, fallen is Babylon in verse 9. And the same thing is true of chapter 22. The Valley of Vision is Jerusalem. Uh, but all of this is going on in a specific historical setting. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, Babylon and her leaders last time. Um, Basically, the main progression of chapters 21 and 22 is this giant Assyrian invasion of the Palestine area. And it starts when Babylon it's herself falls to Assyria, which was Judah's false hope. Isaiah has been warning against, you know, don't trust in Egypt for help. Don't trust them because they can't save you. But Babylon was another nation that they were thinking about trusting for help. And when Babylon falls to Assyria, well, you know, they no longer have that to rely on either. In verses 11 through 17, we have the Arabian strongholds that get overrun, Babylon's allies. And so the Assyrians basically knock over each barrier or buffer that exists between them and Israel. And by the time you get to chapter 22, we find that the city of Jerusalem herself is in danger of coming under attack. Um, which the historical setting of that probably lines up with what happens in the uh, chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39. Whenever Hezekiah was king, Sennacherib invaded the land of Palestine, captured some 40-something odd cities, shut Hezekiah up like a bird in his cage. That's the language used in his own annals. And then he collected a heavy tribute from Hezekiah. But that's where the Bible and uh, the Assyrian history start to differ a little bit. Uh, the Assyrians claim that they took the tribute and went home, and that was the end of it. Uh, the Bible claims that the Assyrians were driven home because an angel destroyed their entire army. Um, now, you be the judge, which makes more sense. Uh, did the Assyrians decide to suddenly be merciful to Hezekiah for revolting against him? Did they suddenly have a change of heart and you know, leave his city intact and him alive on, and on the throne? Or did God see the need to intervene in history? Well, I mean, it raises some questions. You know, the Assyrians obviously have a motivation for why they would not mention getting destroyed in their records because, you know, the Assyrians never recorded their defeats. I mean, you can read their annals. That's the case all over the place. They never recorded when they lost a battle because that was embarrassing. It was all about, you know, how many battles we've won, how many people we've conquered. Um, in fact, you know, we're going to see in the oracle against Tyre, Sennacherib besieged Tyre for years and years, but Sennacherib never mentions that once in his annals because he didn't take the city. He never captured it. Never won. Sennacherib only records the times he wins. So that, of course, he has a perfect win-loss record. He can claim he's undefeated even when he's not. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm sure there are some sports teams out there that try to do that too, but we won't get into that. Um... um Anyhow, we're going to pick up in verse 11, because that's where we left off. The Arabian strongholds getting overrun. Uh, the oracle concerning Duma. One keeps calling to me from Seir. Watchman, how far gone is the night? Watchman, how far gone is the night? The watchman says, morning comes, but also night. If you would inquire, inquire, come back again. The oracle about Arabia. 
In the thickets of Arabia you must spend the night, O caravans of Dedanites. Bring water for the thirsty, O inhabitants of the land of Tima. Meet the fugitive with bread, for they have fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the press of battle. For thus the Lord said to me, In a year, as a hired man would count it, all the splendor of Kedar will terminate, and the remainder of the number of bowmen, the mighty men of the sons of Kedar, will be few. For the Lord God of Israel has spoken. Alright. Um, this is like you got two very short oracles back to back. Uh, and verses 11 and 12 is addressed to, some versions say Duma, and some versions say Edom. Um, now, what, what's the point of that oracle in the verses 11 and 12? How would you characterize what, what they say? it's really an oracle of judgment? I mean, you know, I mean, most of these other oracles have been, you know, God's going to come and smite you and destroy you. And I mean, is that what this says, really? You don't really get that impression from reading those verses there. Um, in fact, this, this whole two verses is this conversation that they're having with the watchman. What's a watchman, by the way? What does a watchman do? This guy that stands on the wall and watches out for the enemy and whatever kind of... Uh... I guess storms, things like that, he sounds the alarm when there's danger. Okay, yeah, he's a guy that would, you know, he would stand on the wall or in a tower and he kind of would look out, you know. He was the city's first way of getting in a, I mean, because, you know, you don't have sophisticated radar technology and things like that. You have the watchman, you know, use your eyes and see what's coming. And so they ask, you know, how much longer till the night is over? Is the night almost over, watchman? And of course, you know, Watchmen in the Bible is used in a military sense, but there's another group of people that are referred to as watchmen in the Bible, and they are? Prophets. Well, prophets, right. And so what's probably going on here is they're asking the prophet if the night is almost over. And what would you say about the answer he gives? Well, he said, morning is coming, but also the night. So that kind of indicates that, yeah, it's, it's, we're, we're coming out of this, but there's more trouble coming. He gives kind of an ambiguous answer, doesn't he? He doesn't really give them a straight answer to their question. Uh, you know, morning is coming, but also night. And so it's, it's you know, there, there's definitely an element of, you know, judgment, but, you know, come back and ask again tomorrow, basically. Um, then we have the other oracle, verses 13 through 17, against Arabia. And what would you say the point of that is? Uh, what does the watchman see <laughs> in verses 13 through 17? Well, Arabia is, is kind of a desert place, uh, an arid region in which the, there's, mm -hmm. not, I mean, there's not much there to sustain life. And so right. uh, when he says in the thickets of Arabia you must spend the night, I think that's probably a little bit of uh, God's sense of sarcasm there, you know, the thickets yeah. of the desert. Um, many yeah, it, it is kind of funny. You know, Arabia doesn't have any forests, so you know, and thickets. I, I mean, I think the, the the gist of thickets here is more probably just off the beaten path. We're in the wilderness, yeah. is the idea. Don. We lived in the desert a long time. You can have thickets of cactus. Yeah, yeah. This is just a bow. Would be what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, verse fourteen tells them to do what. Water for the thirsty. So. Specifically, who, who would be thirsty? Who, who are they bringing water to? The caravans of the Dedanites. Oh, so this is, uh, was this like a, you know, was this just a group of friendly travelers who were, you know, hi, you know, we're in a caravan, we're just vacationing in this area. Was that why they were there? Bring water for the thirsty, O inhabitants of the land of Tima. Meet the fugitive with bread, for they have fled from swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the press of battle. Now, these people aren't just, you know, friendly travelers. They're running from something. What are they running from? They're probably running from the Assyrians. That's what everybody else is running from in that time, yeah. 
Well, I mean, and what happened was the Arabian fortresses, uh, the Arabian. The Arabian fortresses suffered in a campaign from Sargon in 715, um, but another element of this, and this is probably more what this text is talking about, is whenever uh, Babylon and Merodach Baladan had revolted against Assyria in 703, there were some Arabian allies that he had that allied with him, and Sennacherib basically subdued them in 703. Uh, now, set for reference, 703 is two years before Sennacherib invades Judah. So, Judah's kind of next on his invasion trail, his campaign trail. Um, and in verses 16 and 17, in a year as a hired man would count it, we've seen that expression before, it means that we're basically, we're not going to give them any more time than we have to. You know, the hired man is going to go exactly up to his deadline and not a minute further. In a year, as a hired man would count it, all the splendor of Kedar will terminate, um, and the remnant, or the remainder of the number of bowmen, the mighty men of the sons of Kedar, will be few, for the Lord has spoken. Uh, and again, implies that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one who is dictating Arabia's fates. Not Arabia's gods, but Israel's God. Um, and we've seen this kind of language before back in chapter 16 and verse 14. When we talked about Moab, he said within three years as a hired man would count them, the glory of Moab will be degraded along with all his great population and his remnant will be very small and impotent. Yahweh has spoken, implying that he is dictating their fate. Um, so that's chapter 21. Any comments or questions? Anybody just confused by this chapter? Because this is one of... I, these, some of these oracles are kind of like... You've got to know the specific context to have a clue what Isaiah is talking about. Mark? Well, it, it kind of indicates to me, I was looking at this, um, he's talking about those that are close uh, kinfolks to the Israelites here. Mm -hmm. um, the Edomites, the Kedar, Kedarites, mm -hmm. the, uh, all of these are descendants of... Um, of Abraham, yeah, there may be something and, uh, to that. You know, they're, but but they're not of the chosen God's chosen people, and so Israel might have gotten the the idea that when God was speaking about judgment upon them, you know, well, what about all these? And God is telling you, know, they're going to be taken care of too. Everybody is going to meet their own proper judgment, and that may be part of the reason that, that this is spoken of here. Okay, well. Of course, you know, Israel's next on the list uh, in chapter 22. Uh, we're going to see that the city of Jerusalem is the target of Isaiah's next scathing rebuke. Um, chapter 22 and uh, verses 1 through 14 is what we'll read next. And I'll put this up there so you, you know, can kind of compare it to what we read and see if it makes sense or lines up, and if that's even readable. The oracle concerning the valley of vision. What is the matter with you now that you have all gone up to the housetops? You who are full of noise, you boisterous town, you exultant city. Your slain were not slain with the sword, nor did they die in battle. All your rulers have fled together and have been captured without the bow. All of you who were found were taken captive together, though they had fled far away. Therefore I say, turn your eyes away from me. Let me weep bitterly. Do not try to comfort me concerning the destruction of the daughter of my people. For the Lord, God of hosts, has a day of panic, subjugation, and confusion in the valley of vision. A breaking down of walls and a crying to the mountain. Elam took up the quiver with the chariots, infantry, and horsemen. And Kir uncovered the shield. Then your choicest valleys were full of chariots. And the horsemen took up fixed positions at the gate, and he removed the defense of Judah. In that day you depended on the weapons of the house of the forest. You saw that the breaches in the wall of the city of David were many. You collected the waters of the lower pool. You counted the houses of Jerusalem and tore down houses to fortify the wall. And you made a reservoir between two walls for the waters of the old pool. But you did not depend on him who made it. Nor did you take into consideration him who planned it long ago. Therefore, in that day, the Lord of God of hosts called you to weeping, to wailing, to shaving the head, and to wearing sackcloth. Instead, there's gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. But the Lord of hosts revealed himself to me. Surely this iniquity shall not be forgiven you until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. 
All right. Now, now keep in mind, chapters 13 through 27 were against the Gentile nations. So what's an oracle against Jerusalem doing in here? Well, it appears at the beginning that Israel was up there rejoicing over the destruction of their of the other nations around them. Mm-hmm. And they were kind of, they were in a period of gaiety and kind of, you know, ha ha, look at, look at what happened to you. And we're not, you know, that's not happening to us. Well, I mean, I get the impression that their, their celebration is more of a, you know, last hurrah before we get killed kind of thing. I mean, you know, the statement they make in verse 13, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. <laughs> you know, yeah. we know we're going to die. We've got no hope left, so we're just going to live it up, basically. Um... You know, of course, you know, the, the reason this appears here is because Israel's really not different from one of the nations. Not really. Uh, God directs all the nations. He's the one that has led Assyria to Jerusalem's doorstep. Uh, the oracles against these nations are written to Jerusalem to begin with. Uh, it's a lesson for Israel not to put too much trust in the surrounding nations. Uh, now, this passage actually has a dual fulfillment. Um, the Assyrian siege, which almost happened under Sennacherib, but then also the Babylonian siege that later happens under Nebuchadnezzar. Um, you see the same kind of attitude taking place, and Jeremiah confronts it more fully in his book. Um, now, uh, Jerusalem's defense strategy is what? Houses inside all right. Jerusalem's defense strategy was to fortify their city. Well, duh, wouldn't you? Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, was there anything wrong with tearing down the houses? In and of itself, was there anything wrong with tearing down houses to fortify the wall? No, there wasn't. The problem was not the preparations, but the priority. They did not depend on him who made it. They depended on their own strength instead of that of God's. Um... You know, I'm just look, looking at some of these statements here. Valley of Vision. Why would he call them the Valley of Vision? Got a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, vision seems to be her principal lack, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, I'm I'm reading a, a book on submarine on a submarine in World War II, and when they were trying to locate the enemy, they brought that submarine up as high in the water as it would go, and they got all the way up on the conning tower and the highest point of the submarine, and they piled it full of lookouts, and they were up there on the top, looking out to see if they could find the enemy. You don't go down in the valley have vision. I mean, you know, when you're driving in amongst the mountains in West Virginia, for example, all you can see is, you know, maybe a hundred yards that way and a hundred yards that way and there's nothing else to see. But when you're up on the mountaintop, then you can look out and you can see the panorama and all the way around you. So here they are in the valley of vision. They're short-sighted. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at this, you know, verse 1, yeah, it pretty much visions the one thing they don't have. It's totally short-sighted. Uh, they go up onto the rooftops. Well, what, you know, what, what were they doing on the rooftops? Were they going out to be lookouts? Is that what they were doing? Were they going up on the rooftops to fix their shingles? Is that why they were up there? Hmm? They were going up there to party. They were going up there to party. Well, I mean, rooftops were a typical place you would go to do that. They'd have a celebration. It wasn't like us. with was slanted roofs. They had flat-top roofs. Um, a lot of partying going on. Verse 2 says, you're slain or not slain with the sword. You know, because the reason you lose this fight isn't because you got stabbed. It's because you were spent all night partying on the rooftop. That's your problem. Uh, Isaiah describes in verses 3 and 4, he describes captivity like it's already happened. He doesn't participate in the celebration. Instead, he weeps at it. You know, he... And he identifies more with God's suffering. Don't try to comfort me concerning the destruction of the daughter of my people. Verse 4. Um, verses 5 through 8, we have kind of a, a day of judgment. God has a day, just like we've seen the day of the Lord come up earlier in Isaiah. Um, he brings Elam into it, Elam taking up the quiver. Now, there's no actual evidence that Elam was literally involved in Sennacherib's army, but you know, there's probably some figurative ways to understand that. 
The city that was, verse, verse 7, the city that was full of noise is now in a valley that is filled with chariots. Uh, the city is helpless. Jerusalem's defense has been removed. She has been surrounded by this vast military and now she has nowhere to run. And then moving on from there, their response was to depend on the weapons of the house of the forest. Solomon's house from 1 Kings chapter 7. Which, it's kind of interesting to think about that because you know, Solomon had, one of, two of Solomon's biggest building projects in his lifetime were, one was the temple, the other was the house of the forest of Lebanon which was his house. And it was, you know, the floor plans was twice the size of the temple and, you know, took twice as much time to build and all this other, you know, all this resources and grandeur dumped into it. Oh, Solomon built a very beautiful temple for the Lord, but he built an even more beautiful house for himself. Uh, Solomon's house was a lasting monument of what it meant to trust in self instead of God. And invested far more time and energy in self. Uh, so they bring out the weapons of the house of the forest, they, re they tear down houses, they need to fix the wall. Uh, this was a common strategy in the ancient world, it's not something that Jerusalem invented. Uh, they connect and they made a reservoir between two walls from the waters of the old pool. Now that's actually a reference to something Hezekiah did in 2 Chronicles 32. Um, in 2 Chronicles 32, in verses... Uh, Beginning in verse 2, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he had intended to make war on Jerusalem, he decided with his officers and his warriors to cut off the supply of water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. So many people assembled and stopped up the springs and the stream which flowed through the region, saying, Why should the king of Assyria come and find abundant water? He took courage and rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down and erected towers on it and built another outside wall and strengthened the milo in the city of David and made weapons and shields in great number. Which corresponds rather well with what we just read in Isaiah. Hezekiah makes these fortifications and he, you know, he makes the reservoir to cut off the water supply outside the city so that the Assyrians don't have any drinking water. Um, now, you know, again, the point, the problem wasn't that Hezekiah did these things, that these things were wrong to do. The problem was the attitude and the motivation that existed within doing these things, of not trusting God first. Now, to Hezekiah's credit, he does eventually trust God. We see this in chapter 36. So, you know, we don't want to razz on him too hard, but God. Um, another thing that is going to come out in this is that Hezekiah has some advisors working under him that aren't the best advisors. We're going to learn that in a minute. Um, you know, but the problem is, again, not depending on him who made it. Instead of depending on what our hands make, we should depend on the one whose hands make us. Instead of making plans, we should involve the master planner as well. In verses 12 through 14, we throw night before the night before the destruction parties. Uh, God called for repentance, for weeping, for wailing, and sackcloth. You get an image in your head, kind of like what you know they did in the city of Nineveh, whenever Jonah went through the city preaching. Forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. You know that's the kind of thing. Then they reacted by fasting and putting sackcloth on themselves and saying, you know, we're sorry, we are, we, you know, we're regretful for what we've done. You know, but. God called Israel to do that, and what did they do in response? Let's throw a feast. Let's have another, let's have a banquet. <laughs> People live with excess. They slaughter meat. They drink wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's quoted in the New Testament, actually. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 32, Paul quotes it and says that, you know, if the resurrection's not real, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. There's no more point. This is it. There's no point to the rest of it. There's no hope beyond this life. Hopelessness and impending death become a rationale for self-indulgent living. It also is the uh, words of the rich fool in Luke 12 who didn't factor in death. You know, eat, drink, and be merry. But he didn't know that he really was going to die tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. And God says, no, you're not. You know, your self-indulgence you know, doesn't factor in death. He didn't take God into account either. Didn't depend on the Maker either. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, what the people are really doing here is they're just living out what God said to Isaiah all the way back in chapter 6 in verses 9 and 10. Go tell this people, keep on listening but do not perceive. Keep on looking but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. The people are basically just doing exactly that. Isaiah has called them to repentance and they have rejected it and ignored it. Their behavior is classified as unforgivable. This iniquity will not be forgiven you, verse 14. Because, well, you know, it's like Numbers 15 talks about. There's two kinds of sin. There's the kind that was unintentional that you could be forgiven of. And then there was the high-handed sin. The sin that said, you know, I don't want anything to do with God. I'm going to do things my way. I don't care what God says. God says there is no forgiveness for that kind of sin. It is a sin... It, well, he has basically blasphemed God. He must be put to death, cut off from the people. Uh, you'll notice also death kind of bookends this section. Uh, you know, verse 2 talks about, you know, they didn't die in the battle. They weren't slain with the sword. Here in verse 13 and 14, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This iniquity will not be forgiven until you die. Um, so, I mean, death is all around in these first 14 verses. Any comments or questions up through verse 14? Alright, now we get to verses 15 through 25, the second part of this. Shebna and Eliakim. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to this steward, to Shebna, who is in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here, and whom do you have here, that you have hewn a tomb for yourself here? You who hew a tomb on the height, you who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. Behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong, O man. He is about to grasp you firmly and roll you tightly like a ball to be cast into a vast country. There you will die, and there your splendid chariots will be, you shame of your master's house. I will depose you from your office, and I will pull you down from your station. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. I will drive him like a peg in a firm place and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. So they will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, offspring and issue, all the least of vessels from bowls to all the jars. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It will even break off and fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, so we got these two characters here, Shebna and Eliakim. Who was Shebna? Who is this guy? He was in charge of the castle. <laughs> he was the he is what we call the head of the household, yeah. uh, the uh, al habith, or I personally like to say the major domo. Uh, which, if you've ever seen Disney's The Lion King, you'll know that the Zazu is the major domo in that movie. Uh, you know, basically his job is to be the you know the main second in command, the king's right hand man, as it were. Uh, it's actually a title used for Jotham in 2 Kings 15 in verse 5. Whenever Uzziah becomes sick with leprosy, Jotham becomes the ruler of the al Habaith, the ruler of the household. Um, so Shebna is second in command to the king. You know, a good, a good, another Bible character to think of when uh, thinking of this role, this position, is what Joseph was to Pharaoh. Uh, whenever Joseph was appointed as Pharaoh's right-hand man, Pharaoh said that only in the throne will I be greater than you. In other words, Joseph had basically the ability to do anything that the king could do, and the only person that could overrule him was the king himself. That's the power that the major domo wields. He has the authority of the king invested into him. Uh, now, Shebna is Hezekiah's major domo. We learn in chapter 36 that Shebna has been demoted by the time Sennacherib arrives at the city. Um, but what, is, what was wrong with Shebna? Why is God so angry with him? Shebna is uh, 
making plans and he's kind of making plans for his burial to be a glorious thing and you know he's going to be somebody and he's going to leave a legacy behind him and all men are going to remember him and this kind of a thing seems to be the case here mm -hmm. really God is kind of more or less telling you know you're going to be like Ozymandias you know, <laughs> you know be a, maybe a pillar and a column that says you know Ozymandias but who is he? Right. Which, I mean, is basically the same problem we had in verse 13 with the people, right? You know, they're feasting and you're saying, we're going to die tomorrow. It's the same thing here. He's basically saying that, you know, no, I'm going to die, so I'm going to plan for my death instead of the nation's life. He builds a special tomb for himself, a glorious tomb. Uh, and so in response, what does God do? Literally, he hurls a hurling, he grasps a grasping, and he winds like a, a winding like a ball. Shebna is going to be tossed aside like an old rag. Uh, kind of like with Jezebel and, and Ahab when they died. You know, they, yeah. they were just kind of thrown out and eaten by the dogs, and the only part of Jezebel left was the palms of her hands. Yeah. Was that Jezebel was palms of her hands were left? Uh, and Ahab. That was Jezebel. But Jezebel, they left nothing they but out, bones. They, they let were out the window. Yeah, with Jezebel, they left nothing but bones, and they kind of, you know, they just devoured everything else, and they couldn't recognize her. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, regardless, it's not a happy thing to say about somebody. And, you know, now, whether Shebna literally went into exile, it's not really known. This might be hyperbole, because what really happens is we find out in chapter 36 that he's just simply been demoted. Um, but what we see is, you know, this, basically verse 19 explains it. He says, I will depose you from your office and pull you down from your station. Shebna's glorious chariots get captured and used by the Assyrians, and Shebna himself becomes considered a shame of his master's house. Now, we don't know a lot about Shebna other than what Isaiah says in this chapter. Uh, how would you like to have this epitaph written about you, right? <laughs> like, oops. But then, Shebna's replacement comes up in verses 20 through 25. Who is Eliakim? <laughs> he was a servant of God, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, Isaiah, you think about it, there's not many people in the Bible who are called the servant of the Lord, or my servant, my God. Isaiah was called that back in chapter 20, and... You know, when you get to Isaiah 40 through 55, there's an important theme around the servant of the Lord. There was a big debate among the rabbis about who, who is the servant of the Lord. Uh, whenever the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53 and he asks, of whom does the prophet speak, of himself or someone else? You know, he's alluding to that question that they're asking. You know, who is the servant of the Lord? Some of the rabbis thought the servant of the Lord was Eliakim, actually. You know, and that that was who Isaiah was talking about in that time. Um, now, Ultimately, he's not the ultimate fulfillment of that. We understand it to be fulfilled in Jesus. Um, but you'll notice a couple things. First of all, verses 20 through 25 are bracketed by the phrase, in that day. Um, you'll notice also that Eliakim, the way he is exalted, he's given a robe and a sash. He's given Shebna's authority, which is the same thing as the king's authority. He becomes a father to Jerusalem. He gets the keys to the house of David, the authority to open and shut. Uh, and there's actually a little bit of a word play going on here. Um, it says here in... Uh, it says that Eliakim, I will place... I will drive him like a peg in a firm place in verse 23. Uh, well, the word Eliakim is a play on the word place, makom. They're actually from the same root in the Hebrew. And he, Eliakim is like a tent peg. What was it? Why does he call him a tent peg here? What was a tent peg for? Securing a tent. It was basically the foundation of a tent in some respects. Hmm? Stability. You know, it's like a Zechariah 10.4, you know, draws a parallel between a tent peg and a rock foundation. Uh, in Zechariah 10.4, what was it? Where it mentions that from them will come the cornerstone, from them the tent peg, from them the ruler of battle. And then every ruler of all them together. Now, uh, also, verse 23, he becomes a glory to his father's house, which is contrasted with the fact that Shebna is a shame to his father's house. In verse 18, instead of being a disgrace like Shebna, Eliakim wields authority to bring glory. 
Uh, verse 24 is a positive statement. They're going to hang all the glory of his father's house on him, stressing his dependability, the responsibility of his house will be placed on him. And then verse 25 ends with a warning because the tent peg can still give way because trust in God still ultimately needs to trump trust in man. Now, with the five minutes we have left, are there any other comments or questions before I jump into this next thing? Um, just things you want to notice about chapter 22? Alright, now there is a one instance in the New Testament where I definitely think this passage is being alluded to in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, so we'll go there just now. Um, and that brings us to Matthew chapter 16, which is, in many ways, one of the more controversial word plays that we find in the New Testament. Uh, when Jesus, beginning in verse 13, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, what does that have in common with Isaiah 22? giving him the authority here, basically, over the, the, the binding and the loosing, and he's giving uh, Hilkiah, Hilkiah Eliakim. Eliakim, I'm sorry, son of Hilkiah, yes. <laughs> basically the same kind of authority. Okay. You know, deposing someone and putting another man in his place, and, and kind of here uh, in verse 1 of 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up testing Jesus, so on and so forth. Well, they were kind of the the head hogs of people people looked up to in that day, and mm -hmm. Jesus was saying you know, they're they're going away. Mm -hmm. Well, well put. Uh, you know, we got some parallels. Both of these are commissioning texts. Uh, God commissions Eliakim to replace Shebna. God commissions Peter, and I do think that Peter is representative of the twelve other all twelve apostles here. Both passages mention keys. What are keys for? Door. Opening and closing. You know, the person with the keys decides who gets in and who doesn't. You know, who goes in, who comes out. Uh, you'll notice there's a parallel between the actions of opening and shutting and binding and loosing. There's a definite parallel there. Uh, both passages involve a word play, Eliakim and place, and Peter and rock. The word for rock in Greek is Petra. Um, and both individuals are acting as foundations. And here's the part where you, you, know, you get into trouble because you know, people have capitalized so hard on trying to find every way possible to make Peter not be the rock that they miss this important point. That the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, and that the twelve foundation stones within the heavenly Jerusalem herself are, in fact, the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Revelation 21.14 There is no problem with seeing Peter as the rock in the same way that there was in seeing Eliakim as the tent peg. Um, and the fact that Catholicism has abused this passage is no reason to just pendulum swing in the other direction. Is what I, uh, at least that's my thought on that anyway. Um, now, uh, all of this to say, you know, what does this tell us about apostolic authority? The apostles' authority. Directly from God. Came directly from God. Okay. Not to be, uh, not to be questioned. Right. Might we say that they are, in some sense, Jesus's major domos, <laughs> the heads of his household? You know that only in the throne is he ultimately greater than them, in terms of authority, in terms of what he has the right to tell people to do. Uh, you know, so pe people want to people want to put the apostles on some kind of you know second class status, like we don't really care what they say, but we care what Jesus says. You know, red letter type Christianity. But when you think about it, Jesus left his apostles with his authority. He delegated that to them. Uh, now Jesus' messengers had the authority to bind and loose, although everything in the text, according to this text, everything they bound had already been bound, everything they loosed had already been loosed in heaven, and that they're basically just carrying out heaven's delegation in this instance. Um, 
I mean, so that, that, that's just some things to think about. It's interesting to see this text and the influence it has. Um, I'm not the one that came up with these connections. One of my professors wrote his master's thesis on this, and I just steal it from him like I steal everything else. But, um, but this is something interesting to contemplate and think about. Uh, are there any comments or questions before we close? Well, if not, then we'll pick up with Isaiah 23 next time.